So good evening, everybody. Uh, Dan Gordon from Flash Fire. I'm going to uh, go through without a hose line seminar tonight. And I can do this, you know, I see the lights in the background. Let me just dim those a little bit. Hold on. Set the mood so they're not in, right in your face. So I could definitely, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of avenues of this class. Um, you know, this is a class that we put together uh, to begin with uh, about almost a year ago now in uh, uh, Syracuse for Augie Matt and uh, the Syracuse Rescue Week uh, conference, and it it was very well received, even more than I thought it would. Um, and it was kind of one of those where someone said, hey, come up with an idea that your burn trailer can, um, you know, work with on the rescue side uh, because it's a rescue conference. Obviously, we just want to go out there and do our regular flashover um, fire behavior class. But um, we definitely a lot of the same meat and potatoes are there. And that's kind of as I was putting it together, I kind of realized that that a lot of what we talk about in our regular flash over our regular fire behavior class, that really um, becomes even more important when you talk about operating without a hose line. Because when you have a hose line, you put the fire out and it's true, all your problems go away as, as corny of a saying as that is. Um, but we have to bring, us, bring ourselves back to reality and realize what can happen um, or how we're going to react when we don't have a hose line with us. And there's a, many reasons for that. So my goal tonight is not to go through the entire class. Um, I want to give you guys an overview of kind of what the class is and how I structured it. Um, and I will go through a few sections of it, uh, but it was very well received. It was a, you know, about a seven, eight hour, six, seven hour class or so. Um, we're gonna be back there uh, this coming year. And we also are going to be offering it at the uh, South Windsor Rescue Weekend, and um, we can offer it for any department out there. So uh, I have the chat window open. If you have any questions as I go through, please, uh, you know, put your, uh, if you have any comments, questions, uh, experience on this, uh, put that in there in the chat window, and we'll kind of go through it as, um, you know, as we go tonight. I'm planning to go an hour, hour 15 max. So nice, short and sweet, just kind of give you guys, uh, again, my thoughts on this. So uh, what we took exactly from our fire behavior class that we uh, transitioned directly into the without the protection of a hose line class was the fire behavior, the gear and the thermal imager stuff. So I'm not really going to go into that tonight. Uh, we do that completely um, when we do this class, when we do the fire behavior class. Uh, because all of that, again, plays into part. We can't just be running in there not knowing how our gear works, how to use a thermal imaging camera. And in my opinion, the most important part, how fire is going to behave, the building construction, that type of stuff. So we want everyone to be aware of those things. The reality is, and even for someone that teaches, you know, a fire behavior class probably isn't going to like it. If you have a hose line with you, how much do you really need to know about fire behavior, right? You open up the hose line, you put as much water in as you can, put the fire out and you go home. But once we start operating without a hose line, once we start going above the fire, once we have the ability to vent before a hose line's in place, that's when fire behavior is really important because as we've seen from videos throughout the internet, if we start venting windows, if we start cutting roofs and we don't have a hose line ready yet, um, it, things could get bad. Things have gotten bad in the past. And so that's a lot of what we talk about. Um, although people like to just think of this as a search class, we really don't teach you search at all. That's not the focus on it. Everyone that comes in and takes this class should be able to do a primary search, should at least understand how their equipment works. I do think of this as a more advanced class, not from the skill set but from the mindset, if you will. So one of the things, um, so we go through those fire behavior, gear, thermal imaging. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen. And what I'm gonna do a little different tonight is I'm not going to actually play the PowerPoint. Um, I am just going to scroll through it like 
like I would be editing it essentially. Um, so you guys will be able to see that. You should be able to see that now. I'm just reorganizing my two screens a little bit. And again, any questions you guys have as we go, we have a smaller group tonight, which is great. So hopefully we can get some interaction. Um, everyone can see my second screen, right? Should be good. Uh, so you should be able to see the head head uh, slide without the protection of a hose line. So, and I put the uncomfortable reality and actually let me back up a minute. The way we uh, originally designed this class was like any other class. We would do PowerPoint for, you know, two, three hours and then go out and do the burns. And we did that the first day, worked out perfectly, no issues. And then what actually happened was the uh, second and third days, we had some weather issues. And so it was supposed to rain later in the day. And so we were thinking, how can we get the burns done earlier? And so what we did was, we, as it, it's kind of labeled up here, we did the fire behavior, we did the gear, we did the thermal imaging part, just like we do in our, our regular flash over fire behavior class. And then we said, hey, let's go outside and try to beat the uh, rain, beat the weather and do our burns. So we went out, we did the burns, and then we came it back in and did the remainder of the PowerPoint. And it was so well received and we felt much better about it that we just turned and said, that's the way we're doing the class from now on. And so that's, it, it kind of uh, breaks it up a little bit too. But uh, when we do this class now, and when we did it uh, subsequently, we that's how we structured it. We actually put the burns in the middle. We gave you the facts went to do the burns and then talked about some of the tactics behind that. So the uncomfortable reality, the bottom line is we don't want you to be comfortable per se um, and comfort can come in many different, you know, realms, if you will, but you're not supposed to be comfortable searching in a building that's on fire. If you don't have a hose line. Okay. That, but it still needs to get done a lot of the time. And there's, as I put together this class, as I designed this class, as I posted about this class, I got a lot of feedback, some positive, some negative, a lot of them being uh, along the lines of this is a dangerous tactic to teach. You got to be careful doing this. All right. Not you're going to get guys killed. I didn't get that, but you have to be careful kind of selling the idea of operating without a hose line. And some of the feedback I thought was phenomenal uh, and true. I don't want someone fresh out of fire one thinking that's showing up on an engine saying, hey, let me not stretch a hose line. Let me go do a search instead because it's cool. That's certainly not what we want. But at the same time, this is something, and I think I will prove it to you as we go through it. A, it's not killing firemen every day. And B, it's very important to our job because there are times that we're going to be put in this position, whether we like it or not, whether it's our plan or not. So yes, I operate in a department where it probably is the plan, right? You have an engine and a truck, the engine has water, the truck does not. Um, many times we get there first or at the same time. So even if you stretch a line at the same time as we walk in the building, by definition, we're going to be in there first. But I can prove it to almost every department out there that there's going to be scenarios, there's going to be situations where you have to operate without a hose line whether that's designed or not. And so me personally, I would rather you be trained to do that so that you're not put in that position and then forced to do it without any training. So I do a couple of case studies at the beginning. I do a couple of case studies at the end and I don't make them all happy-go-lucky, joyous ones, right? So I actually started off with one of, in my opinion, the most obvious ones, um, Black Sunday. And so we talk about, you know, guys having to bail out. Uh, I play the audio. I'm not going to play that tonight, but we play the audio, which if, you, if you've never heard it, um, it's chilling. So I certainly recommend it. And it just talk, it, we just talk about this is the reality, right? So we can't just look at the all, this is all good. We're making grabs. We're going to metal day. We're getting sighted. That's awesome. But there's the other side of it as well. Things absolutely can go wrong and we have to be prepared for that. So we play the audio. This is the second case study and it probably won't hit home tonight uh, as much as it does in the class. But in the class, especially after what we go through with the burns, this one, and I, I hate to use the word um, 
perfect, but it's a perfect case study. Yes, a fireman died. It's a perfect case study for what we're looking at, what we're talking about, mixing the fire behavior with the protection of a hose line or non-protection of a hose line. And why I really like this case study is because it wasn't all doom and gloom. They made three, uh, yeah, three successful rescues. Now, a fireman died, so by no means are we walking outside and slapping each other on the back. But, you know, whereas Black Sunday, there were no rescues made, unfortunately, we lost firemen. In this one, we really have both sides of the coin. We made a couple of rescues and we lost a fireman. So I will talock about that a little bit later. Uh, Clackamas County, Oregon, all good here. Um, two firemen essentially did a reverse VES, if you will. They searched inside of the building. Uh, found a victim and then used their bailout systems to bail out. And so this is a excellent case study again on the um, you know some of the successes of operating without a hose line. In their case, they're on a heavy rescue. so even if they wanted to stretch a line, they would not be able to. Um, but again, a good kind of and you can listen, Google, you'll find case studies all over the place, okay, but these are the ones I picked out to use at the beginning. So one of the things that always came up was, you know, people say, and where did this class title come up? If any of you guys have read uh, the FDNY metal book, you'll probably know that this, this uh, the title of this class is basically become, I don't want to call it a joke, but almost like the required line in the FDNY metal book that, that a member was operating without the protection of a hose line. Okay. So they were conducting a search. They were, uh, um, you know, making a grab or something. But if there's a hose line there, it doesn't get the same, you know, there's not the same amount of danger involved, which I agree with. And so that's kind of where this title became, uh, came from, is talking about the FDNY Metal uh, Day book, operating without a hose line. That's the most dangerous situation that you can be in. And I don't disagree with that. Um, but as I will allude to, we will actually talk about the numbers and instead of just saying it's dangerous or it's not dangerous, how dangerous is it based on the numbers? Okay. So I, that's how, kind of how I started this program and how I came up with um, that title. But a title doesn't say everything. So I needed to define what is actually operating without a hose line, right? Because I'm sure some of you guys have, a, have one opinion on it. Some of you guys have another opinion on it. And some of you, all of you may be right, but if I'm going to produce a class or talk about a class, talk about a topic on this, we all need to be on the same page, okay? So that's where this kind of came from, uh, an actual definition on that. So you could read it up there, operating without the ability to be immediately protected by a hose line. And this is where I kind of put my twist on it that is flowing a sufficient GPM able to adequately cool the environment, change fire conditions, and allow the continued operation of personnel in the fire environment. So let's break that down a little bit because I think that's important to my definition. Um, and I was never a lawyer, I never went to law school, but sometimes when I'm writing these definitions, I, I like to pick apart and figure out every avenue. So if I'm stretching an inch and a half hose line and Unfortunately, I'll use the example of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, operating inside of a furniture store with an inch and a half inch hose line. Technically, they had a hose line with them. Are they under the protection of a hose line? Many would argue yes. But did it have the adequate or sufficient GPM to change that environment? We all know no. We all know now no. So it's not just important enough to have a hose line with us, we need to consider the amount of cooling, the amount of effect that that hose line is actually going to have. Okay. So that's something to think about. We may stretch the wrong hose line. I've stretched an inch and three quarter and halfway through it thought, crap, I wish I had a two and a half. But for those members operating with us, maybe doing a search, that needs to be communicated. Hey, we're not making progress on this. You are not truly in my definition protected by a hose line, a charged hose line. Okay. So then I kind of go into where would we find ourselves without a hose line? And I'll talk about Black Sunday because there were hose lines in operation, but I would 
argue those guys were not uh, protected by a hose line. So again, where are we going to find ourselves in these positions? And this is a lot of times where, um, yeah, this is a lot of times where, you know, you have, you, I get buy-in from, oh, we don't really operate without a hose line all that often. And then you go through some of the scenarios and a couple kind of kick in, oh, oh, hey, maybe we do operate without a hose line and we don't even realize it. So obviously there's the obvious ones, right? Uh, I work on a truck, I work on a, you know, whatever, we don't have water, there's no engine on scene yet, or the engine that's on scene is having an issue, or the hose line's in the process of being stretched, or we have a precautionary dry line stretch. Okay, those are pretty obvious. We don't have a charged hose line, okay? But then how about some of the other ones, right? So if you're operating on the second floor of a private dwelling for a fire on the first floor, uh, but there's a hose line operating on the first floor, are you protected by a hose by the protection of a hose line? And I guess you can make the argument either way, but if you have a fire on the first floor and you're on the second floor and there's no hose line up there, I don't think you're protected by a hose line. Are you safer than if there was no hose line operating at all in the building? 100%. But this is where Black Sunday kind of comes from, is there was a, a, a hose line on the fourth floor, a hose line on the fifth floor, so everyone's protected, great. There was an issue with the hose line on the fourth floor, so then that fifth floor hose line was brought down to the fourth floor, leaving those guys up on the fifth floor without a hose line. So it can even change fluently throughout the, or fluidly throughout the, um, the incident. You could start by operating with the protection of a hose line and then things change. Maybe the line bursts, maybe there's kinks. So you need to realize that even in a department where you're not going to initially be operating without the protection of a hose line, that could change as the incident progresses. And so this whole, oh, we're never gonna be in that position. Yeah, I don't, I don't really buy that, okay? Um, Hose line being positioned, repositioned, as I mentioned before, as a backup line or for fire extension. So there are times where you're short hose lines. So maybe you're on the first floor and then they report uh, extension to the second floor. And so that line that's on the first floor now uh, heads up to the second floor. So now you are on the first floor, not protected by a hose line. Okay. Hopefully they knock down the main body of fire, but the idea behind this class and behind our mindset needs to change at that point. It doesn't mean we need to evacuate, but we need to be aware, hey, that lifeline that I had right next to me is being repositioned. I need to be prepared to operate accordingly. Okay, so that's the big takeaway there. All right, um, you know, a couple of these are big and they happen all the time, okay? Uh, a large warehouse, a large structure, we may not be best off stretching a charged hose line in initially. We may want to locate where the location of the fire, we may want to locate where the fire is before we start stretching a charged hose line in there, especially a two and a half. It's a large structure. We're probably stretching a two and a half. And if you've ever had to take a two and a half and you brought it in the wrong way and turn it around and bring it back the other way, you know, you can say it's technique, it's not happening, okay? A charge two and a half stretched 25, 30 feet in the wrong direction in zero visibility, in my opinion, is useless at that point if it went the wrong way, okay? Um, I'm sure there are guys that could get it out and, and reposition, but for the most part, when we don't know the location of the fire and it's a large structure like that, I'm not talking a ranch style house or something like that, I'm talking a larger commercial structure, we may be better off staging that line outside until we actually know the best avenue to get it to the fire. And so anyone that's going in there searching for that fire is now unprotected uh, from a hose line, okay? Um, and, and those situations, especially with the fire behavior that we see today, and we talk about that in, in the class, these situations generally are going to be heavy smoke, but zero or very little heat, especially the taller ceilings. You're still going to get zero visibility, um, but certainly if I go into a large structure and I feel heat, that that has to be, that's different than a private dwelling. If I'm going to a large area and I'm feeling heat, that has to, something has to go up in the back of my head. Um, it's not going to be hair, I promise you, but something has to go up in the back of my head that something's not right because a large area like that, that's producing a large amount of heat means something bad's happening, Okay. 
but in the scenario of a large area, heavy smoke, but no heat, which is kind of what I expect, we don't want to stretch the wrong direction or we're going to be in a, in a, in a major hurt to try to uh, make up for that. Delayed hose stretch. So delayed could be because the engine's not there yet, but most, most likely it might be if we're doing a standpipe, most departments are not operating with standpipe every day. And even if you do, it does take time. Um, so that's certainly something. Uh, if you are in a true high rise, you may only have control of one elevator initially. And so the truck may go up, at least the way we operate, the truck may go up to locate the fire before the engine goes up. So I know if I'm going in the elevator and the engine isn't there yet or not in the lobby yet or hasn't stretched yet, I know I'm going to be operating by myself for at least a period of time. Okay. Now that may be different from your department, but it's at least something that you need to think about. If you're getting in that elevator and there's only one elevator, by definition, you're going to be up there before anybody else. So things to think about. But transition that to the rural or suburban area, just a long stretch up a driveway. I can walk up a driveway quicker than someone can stretch hose up a driveway. And so if it's a complicated stretch, if it's a long stretch, um, that is going to obviously, I'm going to be able to get into position without a hose line quicker than someone with a hose line can be. So again, have that in your mind. Hey, there's not a hose line here. This isn't our, you know, house that's 25 feet off the driveway that we can stretch in, in 90 seconds too. Okay. And then immediate need, immediate need for rescue. Do we have a known victim? What is considered a known victim? At what point, and I don't have the answer to this question. This is something that you guys need to think about. At what point are you going to say, hey, I'm in an engine, but I have a report of a victim and I'm not going to stretch. I am going to do a search instead. And these are, you know, we're not getting into an officer development class, but if there's any advice I have as a new officer, it's when you're on that rig riding around your district or in your car riding around your town, just make scenarios for yourself. So look at a house and say, hey, all right, if I had fire on the second floor, what would I do? Okay, now if I had fire on the second floor and reported people trapped in the attic on the third floor, what would I do? That's what I generally do in the front of the rig to make scenarios for myself to just kind of keep myself, what would I do? How would I react? What signal would I give? Or what first in report would I give? That's the best thing that I've found to kind of keep myself fresh and thinking about some of the possibilities out there. So I kind of go into what we want you to take away from the class. And I almost see this class as a train the trainer where, um, the, and it was an open enrollment class when we did it. So a little bit different of a, a variety of individuals versus just like a, a contract class for a department. So everyone wanted to be there. Everyone bought into at least the title and description of the class. And many people had issues at their own department with buying into the fact that they would operate without a hose line. Um, so what, what I really wanted guys to get out of this class was to be able to define what it is, um, which I already talked to you guys about knowing the truth about the line duty desk, which is what we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, but also being able to, uh, eloquently and intelligently discuss both this topic and the associated, uh, topics for it. And so I'll give you an example. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a couple minutes and kind of just go on a rant about that. So. You get a lot of, of, and I've seen it, you know, you get a lot of chiefs that say, we can't operate without a hose line, it's dangerous. And then you'll get the firefighter that says, that's bullshit, we can operate, we have to do searches. And that, both of those, both of that logic is completely false, right? We do have to operate without a hose line, but we have to do it smartly. And if you are a firefighter or a lieutenant or a captain trying to convince your chief that thinks it's dangerous, uh, I think the best thing you can do is come at them both with facts and education on why it is or is not. So instead of just saying, no, we have to do it's life safety. Well, you can make the argument that you put the fire out and then everything gets better. But go at them with, well, how many people actually die a year, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then talk about the education behind it. No, I agree. We can't just be operating without a hose line without being educated on the overall topic, on the overall fire behavior, how to use the search rope if we have that, how to use a thermal imaging camera and things like that. So you can't just go like that with a chief that's, um, or 
I shouldn't even say a chief. It could be a company officer and you're a firefighter. You can't go like that against someone that has an opinion. You have to massage the facts into it, in my opinion. So that's kind of what I wanted people to be able to do when they walked away from this class is if they had that chief or they had that company officer that said, nope, we can't operate without a hose lines too dangerous. We're going to get someone killed to be able to go at them with facts or go at them is probably wrong term, but have a debate with them or have an educational discussion with them with facts, um, both positive and negative. The other thing that I always, uh, I laughed at was I, I did go to a department where we talked about, you know, we were doing the fire behavior class and, um, you know, they said, well, we don't like to operate without a hose line. And so uh, we don't like guys going above without a hose, all that stuff. And so our solution with that was instead of having a ladder company uh, with um, no water on it, they bought quints, right? And the quints never get used as quints, they're engines. So in the end, they're ladder companies anyway. But that was the um, thought process behind putting water on every truck. And I said, okay, I mean, you know, obviously I disagree with that, but I'm not, you know, going to get, I'm not going to get into a debate about it. Um, but I'll give you one guess. Uh, someone put in the chat, what do you think rolled up? What th three of something rolled up right after that for the class? What do you, what do you think those were? And they had firemen in them. They had turnout gear in them. They had SCBA in them. They had water can in them. They had irons in them. Three ambulances. So I said, all right, well, where's the uh, hose and water on that? And the chief just kind of turned to me like, huh, interesting. And so there's a lot of departments. We're going EMS. I get it. But you're putting firemen on them. You're, they got gear. They got all the other tools on there. What happens if they're first due? Are you expecting them to stay outside and not operate? Because I wouldn't be. And so those are things to think about. We are operating. We are showing up on apparatus without a hose line if we're running ambulances. So that's my one story on that. And again, I, I kind of go back what makes this class different from some of the other ones that we do. I'm very uh, aware that we are teaching you something that is inherently more dangerous than some of the other uh, items out there. So um, I don't want that to, I, I don't want you to think that that's in vain. Um, it is a hundred percent aware to me that I could teach someone something here that could get them jammed up. Um, but my hope is that what we're teaching here will keep you from getting jammed up and also allow you to operate effectively if you're put in that position. So I'm going to skip through this. So these are some of the sources out there. Uh, I, I, I've done, I'm done with putting my sources at the end of the presentation because everyone's checked out at that point. Um, so I put my sources right at the beginning so that you can jot them down, you can do your own research. And in the end, there's a lot of good information out there. So these are all some of the, um, the research that we use. Um, the Firefighter Rescue Survey, I'll show a couple graphs, uh, but it's an excellent resource out there. You can scan in. A rescue and you don't you don't need permission from anybody you just put it in and that's what allowed us to compile this graph and so i i took um all of the rescues that are documented on there and i should have put in i forget how many years it is uh but it's probably like the last five or six years and i have a few different graphs but this was kind of the one that i ended up going with uh did that search crew that located the victim physically have a hose line with them during search and uh, sixty percent, so well over half did not, and so to me that kind of proves that we are rescuing victims and we do not have a hose line with us. Now, this uh, you know survey doesn't get into the details of of some of what I would like to see specific for this class, but nevertheless we are making rescues without hose lines every day. So let's learn how to do it safely. Is my uh, is my take. Now, this is my favorite part, uh, one of my favorite parts of the presentation where we actually get into the numbers. Now, if you guys have not seen uh, Bill Carey at, at, on Facebook, and he's uh, he has a, a website now, Data Not Drama. He used to just post on Facebook. Now he has an excellent uh, overall kind of uh, website with articles and everything. I actually spoke or messaged with him today because he just put a post out that basically is the next few slides on this. But how often do you hear it's too dangerous to search without a hose line? And, you know, a lot of guys raise their hands because that's what they're dealing with in their departments. And 
as I say, it doesn't mean that there isn't an increase in the hazard. It doesn't mean that you don't need to have a higher sense of situational awareness. But if we're going to go data driven, let's talk about how dangerous it is. And so this is all research I did myself. I did not take this from anybody else. I downloaded, uh, you can actually go to FEMA and download every single line of duty death uh, from 2010 to, I, I assume you can get uh, up to current. This is probably a year old now. So 2010 to 2022, I think the first half of the year. Um, and it downloads in an Excel spreadsheet and you can filter out each category that you want. Now that's not a hundred percent. I did not read through every single one um, because I did find a couple that were off anyway. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but each of them are categorized. Each of them, I, I was able to filter them in Excel. And so out of 1139 line of duty deaths, we only had 329 die on the scene of a fire. Okay. So what, I mean, first of all, that to me is just, you know, let's stop saying we're losing 100, 120 guys, 20 guys a year, right? We're having 329 die on the scene of the fire. I'm, and I always go into this. I'm, I am a hundred percent for if you die on the scene of any incident that obviously it's a line of duty death. I think it's great that if you die within 24 hours of an incident, it's a line of duty death for the sake of your family. Um, financially and everything. But if we're going to use it as an argument for how we should operate on the fire ground, then we need to actually look at who's dying on the fire ground and how they're dying, right? They're not, we're not killing firemen every day inside of a burning building, okay? So 329 died on the scene of a fire. 43, and you can fact, uh, uh, again, filter search and rescue. But the problem is when you fact when you search 1139 and then filter out search and rescue, search and rescue could mean inside of a fire. It could mean doing a wilderness search. A couple guys died in a scuba diving searching because it's search and rescue. So search and rescue does not just mean while operating in a fire. That was something I did not know before I did this. So in the end, we only ended up with 25 firefighters that died on the scene of a fire while performing what was uh, dubbed search and rescue, okay? So 25 killed on the fire ground conducting search and rescue. 11 of those were killed in collapses while conducting search and rescue, okay? I would argue that a collapse is going to happen whether you have a hose line with you or not. As a matter of fact, uh, in this this presentation was finished before the article came out. But again, Bill Carey brought out a fantastic article. There was no, if I remember correctly, there was no fireman killed without a hose line last year. And even the ones with a hose line, I believe the primary uh, uh, cause of death was collapse. So collapse is killing more firemen than anything else inside of a fire building. We're not dying from flashover overwhelmingly. We're not dying from running out of air. We are mostly dying from collapse at this point, okay? So 11 killed in collapse while conducting search and rescue. And then whether it's fair or not, I absolutely um, take out a few, as you can see up here. Uh, one went into search with no PPE. He was driving by, uh, he was a volunteer fireman driving by saw a house that was on fire, went into search and was killed, okay? The other, um, you know, it was dubbed a line of duty death because it was in the town that he volunteered in, but it was his own house, okay? Sorry, I don't, from, again, the perspective of what we're talking about this class, that doesn't count. Uh, and then two fell down elevator shafts. So again, you know, not what I would consider uh, the danger of operating without a hose line. That's a danger I would find whether I have a hose line or not. And then one died from a fire back in 1981. And uh, it just, he just succumbed to his injuries in the last few years. Okay. So that left me with nine that were truly killed without the protection of a hose line. And then we can discuss that. Uh, and then I go through each of them. So I believe one, uh, three, four, five, six, I believe it was eight incidents and one incident had two firefighters that were killed. Um, so, you know, you can read them up here, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, Bryan, Texas, Maryland, uh, Brooklyn, Worcester, California, and Spring Valley. So um, all tragic. If you read the NIOSH reports, all stuff you could learn from. 
but we're talking about in 12 years, nine firemen dying from without the protection of a hose line. So I don't think that that's an epidemic that's killing firemen left and right. And as you can see up here, you know, a couple, uh, one of them is searching for a down fireman. I mean, if you're not going to go into that, then I don't know what you are going to go into. Um, other water issue with a standpipe. And, and that's what we get into later. Some of these have those precursors to them that should start to kind of alert you that things are going wrong, okay? Obviously get into hose lines, the most important, water always wins. And, and again, this is a lot of stuff that uh, we talk about in the class more in depth. So the ongoing size up is obviously gonna be our first line of defense. When water doesn't get applied, things are gonna get worse. And so uh, again, water has to be at the forefront of your mind. If you hear someone having a water issue, if you hear we're running out of water, if you hear kink issues, a burst line, you can't continue to operate the same way you were before, okay? And that's going to be a big thing that gets discussed in this in this um, in this class. So go through reasons for no hose line. You know, you may have response patterns, uh, response times, things like that. But again, if you're a truck and your engine's on a normally you run on an engine in a truck, if you're on an engine or you're on the truck, the engine's on EMS running, and you get a report of a fire right away that needs to cross your mind hey our engine is not available right now that will change a couple minutes and so that needs to right away be forefront of your mind we may be delayed getting water here long stretches so someone says oh we don't have high rises so we're not going to be delayed but but long stretches take time especially depending on how your apparatus is set up for it so you need to be prepared for those long stretches that you are going to be operating initially without a hose line. Standpipe's a big one. And if you listen and if you read some of the uh, Lion Dewey deaths out there, uh, not a lot, but many of them are in standpipe equipped buildings where there were issues with the standpipe uh, initially. And just because we're getting water, and this goes back to my definition, right? Uh, Merid one Meridian Plaza, no problem getting water but what kind of water were they getting? Not an adequate amount of water in order to cool the environment or change the conditions. So just because you have water does not mean that you are protected by a hose line. If you're flowing 100 gallons a minute and you have a heavy body of fire, guess what? That's not going to do it. All right. So just be, be aware of some of those issues out there. Anytime you hear and what I'm trying to get uh, across to this is if these are some of the things that you hear on the fire ground, you need to be prepared that water's not just going to show up and you are operating without a hose line. So right away, if you, and I would say in any town USA, if you get a report of a fire in a building where you know you're using that standpipe, you immediately have to assume water's gonna be delayed or inadequate, all right? I work in a department where we use the standpipes every day and I have that assumption. Okay, because it's the big black hole, you put water in on one end, you hope it comes out on the other side, right? Anytime you have delays in determining the location of the fire, that fire is continuing to grow. You need to be aware that when you do find it, maybe you stretch to the wrong location, maybe you were waiting to stretch, you are delayed in getting water on it, all right? Your size up from the beginning of the day, if you have wind, um, right away, wind is, you know, Everything we talk about with fire dynamics kind of goes out the window once you have wind. And no, no one invented wind recently, but we've learned a lot more about it. And you need to be aware that it's going to change uh, how things are going to react inside. So locating the fire obviously is a big thing. Some departments will wait to stretch until they locate it. Others won't. Again, if, if it's a scenario where you are not initially uh, knowing where the fire is, just be aware that that's going to affect the time that it's going to take to get water on the fire. Water problems, this is such a big one, guys. Um, and, and really, uh, this is always my biggest pet peeve because we'll get back to the firehouse and someone will say, someone from the engine will say, oh yeah, we had a, you know, it took me twice to get the rig into pumps or, oh yeah, there was this big kink and it took me, this big kink stuck under the fence and it took me a couple seconds to free it or, yeah, that standpipe, man, I, I was spinning it and uh, it was seized. I needed to put a cheater bar on it. It took me a couple of minutes to get it free. 
And I just want to go up and hit everyone on the head and be like, why didn't you communicate that? And it's, it's, it's the uh, environment we work in. We work with alpha personalities. Everyone, no, everyone wants to succeed. No one wants to fail, but you will fail your guys worse than you can ever imagine. If you do not communicate an issue that you're having. All right. So if you stretch short, if you have burst links, if you have kinks, you have problems getting the engine into pumps, you're running out of water, you have to communicate that. It can't be put on the back burner and say, oh, hopefully I'll fix this issue by the time it becomes a real issue. If you are not communicating it, you are setting guys up. I'm not even going to say for failure, but you're setting guys up for serious injury or death. Okay. The pump operator, if you're on tank water, I better hear you every time it it changes a quarter, right? Hey, you're down to three quarters of a tank. You're down to half a tank. You're down to a quarter of a tank. The first time I hear from you should not be, hey, you're down to a quarter of a tank, all right? So communication on the fire ground. We say the dumbest crap on the fire ground, and yet the most important stuff sometimes gets left out. So please, if you're having an issue, I don't care if you're a probie or a 30-year guy, make that communication. All the time, I'll be like, hey, we can't find the fire. All right. That's telling everyone, particularly above me, we have not located this fire. It could be anywhere. So we have to do we have to communicate more importantly when we're wrong than when we're right. One of the things when we talk about VES um, that I always talk about is I'll, and not like out there out uh, teaching, but just in the firehouse, we'll get a new guy and I'll say, all right, you're going to VES tonight. You know, you're the OV. So you're what's the most important thing to tell me? And we go, we do the drill and I say, all right, how do you do it? And he tells me all of the different stuff and he's usually spot on. And I say, okay, what's the most important thing to tell me? And maybe it's an unfair open-ended question, but I say, what do you think the most important thing to tell me? And he'll always be like that I'm breaking the glass. And I say, okay, so ask for permission. That's fine. But no, after I've given you permission, what's the most important thing to tell me? And he'll always be like that. I found a victim. And I say, no, I don't really care if you found a victim. And he looks at me and he'll be like, that I have fire. I said, I, yeah, I kind of care if you have fire. But no, he's like, uh, that I uh, did a search and it's negative. I'm like, no, I, I really couldn't care less. And he's like, that I'm all right. I'm like, no, I do care about you. But no, I don't really care if you're all right. And he'll look at me and I'll be like, I need to know if you cannot control that door. If you take that window you get in there, you probe the hallway, and then there's no door, or the door's burned through, or you can't control the door to the uh, apartment, or maybe it's not a bedroom, you VES a different room, and there's no door. That's the most important thing to me, because what's going to happen? And then the light bulb starts to click, and it's, oh, the fire is going to spread rapidly throughout the building, potentially. Absolutely. So, the tangent there is we need to communicate when we're not successful and not always just when we are successful. Okay. Rant on. So known life hazard. Uh, this is what we use at work, but you can have your own uh, OSHA, uh, you know, two and two out does say known life hazard, but I don't recall it defining exactly what a known life hazard is. So the bottom line is, have an idea and it doesn't have to be defined exactly like this, but when I hinted before you show up as a crew of three in an engine, maybe there's a scenario where you're going to say, Hey, we're, we're going to leave the hose on the truck and go do a search or go deal with a known life hazard, but have an idea in your mind. What is the barometer of that? What's the known life hazard? Because honestly, 75% of the jobs we go to, we get reports of people trapped. Okay. And 99% of them are BS. So have an idea what actually it means to you if your department doesn't have a set definition of what a known life hazard is, okay? So VES, this isn't a VES class, but we do talk about it because obviously that is the um, pinnacle of what many people also consider operating without a hose line since you're going into a window and there's no hose line with you. So, you know, why would we VES, known location, targeted search, I like to bring up heavy fire on the first floor or a basement fire, and maybe we don't, we can't get in through there. Uh, maybe a clogged first floor if you have a really small house and a lot of guys. I know that's not an issue for a lot. Um, 
larger structures unable to identify the location of the stairs are we going to walk around the first floor for 20 minutes and zero visibility or will we just go straight to the second floor so uh, a couple different options there uh, and i kind of i i forgot that i put this in here but again this is my my pet peeve you need to communicate when things don't go right even more importantly when things do go right all right um so i just kind of go into a little more detail and and uh, Nick, I see you here, but this is the the picture video uh, video. No, I just did it as a picture, but this is that picture where, where I, I can go both ways. And the question uh, I ask is, would you VES this room right here? And and this is my I won't go into a true tangent tonight on the Internet, but um, this is my issue overall with some of these scenarios that are put on Facebook. And it would just be like inch and three quarter or two and a half. Or it would say, would you VES this room? And to me, this is one of those scenarios where it's going to depend on the situation. If you tell me this is daytime, the mother meets me out here. It says, I was home alone. No one's inside there. Am I going to VES this room or VES this room? Absolutely not. What would be the point in that? But at two in the morning, if the mother says, my kid is sleeping in this bedroom, that's a different story. I'm probably going to VES that room at that point. I'm definitely going to VES that room at that point, right? So you need to have all the information in order to make a true decision. So if you want to, if you want to ask a question on the internet, I use the, I use the the videos or the pictures all the time. I think they're great. I, I but I, I don't look at the comments. I don't look to say, oh, this is what I would do or or what I or what I wouldn't do. I just look at it to say. In my department, knowing my staffing, my water supply, that's what I would do or that's what I wouldn't do. And you can make the argument inch through quarter or two and a half all day on this. What other questions do you have? Staffing, do they have a hydrant, things like that. So don't get sucked into the internet uh, world of, oh, they said inch and three quarters, so they must be right, you know? This is from us uh, simulations that we did, but same thing, would you VES this? And, and, and I don't just put it up here and leave it. I'm going to do that tonight, but uh, we get into a discussion on it. What scenarios would you, what scenarios would you not? What are the hazards of doing it? And so those are things we want to discuss. Those are things we want you to be able to size up as you go through, um, you know, your incidents. All right. Um, go through some basic VES tips, but again, not a VES uh, class by any stretch. So one of the main um Again, one of the other main focuses on the class is people think of operating without a hose line on the fire floor, but we can operate without a hose line where the the hose line's on the first floor and now we're going to the floor above. And so that's one of those scenarios that people will say, oh, we don't operate without a hose line. But then you give this scenario. OK, so if you get there one line stretched on the first floor, are you going to search the bedrooms on the second floor before a second line stretch? And they'll say yes. And it's like, OK, well. You're definitely safer then no hose line, but you still don't really have the protection of a hose line. If the fire extends to the second floor of a private dwelling and you are doing a search on the second floor of a private dwelling without a hose line, in my definition, you are operating without the protection of a hose line. And so that kind of, again, gets some ears to perk and be like, oh yeah, I guess maybe we do. And so, you know, listen, I didn't make these up, but these are some of the things that I've been taught over the years. And again, it's communication. Uh, if you're on that lower floor, it's realizing that there are people operating above you, um, listening, 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 and listening is only as good as the people communicating. And so again, Hey, we're making progress on this fire is darkening down. That's a lot different than hearing, you know, the officer 10 times on the radio, lighten up on the line. I need more line, lighten up on the line. I need more pressure, lighten up on the line, you know? So those are things when you start hearing them screaming for more line, you know that they are not getting water under the main body of fire. And if you're above, I'm not saying you have to bail out, but you have to start kind of thinking, hey, all right, in the realm of things getting better or getting worse, things aren't getting better. Maybe they're not quite getting worse yet, but we need to be ready for it to get worse. And if these are the things that you think about, these are the, the things that you can pick up on, you're going to make yourself or keep yourself from getting into the bad situation where you need to go to that bailout system on your right pocket or a ladder. All right. So, and 
I didn't know this slide was next. I haven't done this class in a while, but the bailout system. And so you, I get, just like I get pushed back on operating without a hose line, I'll get pushed back on bailout systems and people will say, oh, I, I don't want a bailout system. I don't want my guys to push in further, push in harder, or think that they can be invincible. And it's just like, well, that's not really the purpose of a bailout system. And when I have the discussion about bailout systems, I always just, I equate it to a seatbelt, right? I don't get into my car and put my seatbelt on so that I can drive more aggressively, faster, change lanes without signaling, all that stuff. I put my seatbelt on in case something happens. I already have it on. I have it with me as a last case resort. Same thing with a bailout system. I don't wear my bailout system so that I can operate more aggressively. I wear my bailout system in case something out of my control happens. I have it there with me in order to, to use and save my life. Okay. So that's kind of how I equate those two. Uh, I'll still get some pushback on that. And listen, in the end, just like a seatbelt, the bailout systems for the individual person, right? The seatbelt doesn't save anybody else's life, but yourself, the bailout system doesn't save anybody else's life, but yourself, I guess you, it's been used before, but the focus of it is saving your own life, okay? Quick case study of where the bailout system was used um, in the Bronx a couple, uh, about a year ago now. And then, um, so then I get into the, some of the modules. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go through, if there's any questions, post them up there. And what I'm gonna go through is some of the buildings that I talk about and how that um, factors into my size up. And then if there's any questions, uh, We'll, we'll take it from there. So what I like to do is we can, we talked about some of the mindset. We talked about some of the things, uh, focus points, and I'll go back to the fire behavior real quick. I'm not going to go through the fire behavior, but the main emphasis that we talk about on the fire behavior side, when we go through the entire program is that the modern fire is oxygen starved, right? And no one is going up to a house fire, taking a two by four out of the front yard, and throwing it onto the house to, to fuel the flames, right? That wouldn't make sense for what we do. But at the same time, there are still people that want to break windows, open up doors without putting water under the fire. Now, I'm 100% for ventilation. I think many times we underperform ventilation, but there are a lot of people that prematurely do it. And so our focus on the fire behavior side, when we're operating when we're operating without a hose line or not getting water onto the fire is to limit our ventilation. Now, once we have water, once we're putting the fire out, I wanna take out as many windows as possible. I wanna get as much ventilation in as possible. But before we have water, we, we probably need to limit our ventilation in order to keep the fire from expanding past our control, particularly if we're going to be operating inside of that fire area. And one thing that we show inside of the flashover container is that it'll get hot, it'll get zero visibility. Uh, and I'm gonna say it again, it gets hot, but it cannot flash over because we are not providing it oxygen. And so that's something that we can do to the best of our ability inside of a dwelling is to try to keep from providing ventilation to it until we have water on the fire. Now, the caveat with that is not everything's in our control, right? Windows can fail, uh, doors can fail. Um, someone that doesn't realize what we're trying to do can take a window. And so just because some people are on the same page doesn't mean everyone's on the same page. So that doesn't mean that it is safe to operate inside of a structure without a hose line. But if we can limit the ventilation, we are limiting the possibility of it flashing over on us until we get water. Nothing's 100%. Nothing is, is um, you know, nothing's guaranteed. But that is the reality. If we can limit the ventilation, limit the oxygen until we get water, we are limiting the potential for flashover to occur. Okay. So I go through these basic four types of construction when I think about operating without a hose line, all right? And this is how I break it down. What's going to kill me, right? Very few of these buildings, everything's gonna kill us, 
Meaning when I talk about a private dwelling, if I get dispatched to a private dwelling fire, which doesn't happen all that much more, uh, the two things I'm thinking about that are going to kill me are collapse or rapid fire transition, right? I can pretty much guarantee you when I go di get dispatched to a high rise multiple dwelling, I am not even thinking about a collapse, okay? But then I have other things that I'm thinking about. Am I thinking about getting lost in a private dwelling and running out of air? Absolutely not. I don't know how that happens. I know that it has happened, um, but that's not what my prime concern is, okay? My prime concern is collapse or rapid fire transition. Obviously, the smaller the structure, the least likely we're gonna be operating without a hose line. And if you just read NIOSH reports and even just read the first abstract, is it in the basement? That's the first question you have to ask yourself, right? We show a video in our in our uh, in the uh, fire behavior part of sizing up what floor the fire is on, and one of them sh shows a lot of smoke coming out of the second floor, but the fire is actually on the first floor. And I'm not going to get into the details of it now. And I always ask, "All right, great. So you show up and you say fire on the second floor. You open up the front door and the fire is on the first floor. It surprises you." But is that going to get you killed? No, because fire greets you at the front door. You open up your hose line, put the fire out, and you're all well and good. But thinking the fire's on the first floor and it actually being in the basement kills firefighters every year. Okay. So that has to be a prime uh, forefront in your mind when I'm going to a private dwelling fire. Is this fire below me or is it actually on the first floor or second floor where it's reported? Okay. Um, you know, generally quick stretches in private dwellings. We don't get into, I don't think I get, yeah, I don't get into it too much, but just have a basic idea of the private dwellings in your area, ranch, raised ranch, and, and some of the nuances of that. I think a raised ranch is one of the more dangerous ones that we go to just because of that wide open staircase from generally the lower level to the upper level, uh, communication issues with first floor, second floor, basement, first floor. So I think the raised ranch is definitely something that uh, can kind of sneak up onto you as, as an issue. Um, you know, rapid fire involvement obviously is a, is a high possibility with a private dwelling. Uh, vent limited to flash over can happen very quickly, um, especially if you don't have that hose line ready. But it is not ingrained in us to go in and close that front door behind us if we don't have a hose line. But that's what we're doing. You know, if we're opening up that front door, we're giving it that oxygen to potentially hit flashover conditions. I will admit, I don't always remember to close the front door behind me when I go in. It is not ingrained in my head. I've got not a lot of time on, but I was never uh, brought in. You know, I have 15 years when I went through the academy, it was never, it was check and chalk the door. It wasn't check the door and then close it behind you and control it. And so that's something that I've had to get used to. Um, so again, it, there's there's that transition of teaching new guys and hopefully they'll they'll kind of bring it with them. Now that said, I don't like saying close the door behind you. That's going to get you killed. I want you to control the door behind you. If we let that door latch behind us, when we need to get, get out in emergency, we probably won't. So make sure that there's something in between that door and the jam so that it does not latch behind us. But by all means, if you're going in without a hose line, try to control that door behind you as best you can. All right. I show this video. I'm not going to show it tonight, but it just, it doesn't even, it says bad ventilation. It wouldn't be bad ventilation if the hose line was stretching in, but it, you know what? I'll play it quick. It transitions. I'll talk as it goes. It's not that it's bad ventilation. It's that it's bad ventilation because there's no hose line coming on it. So you're going to see how quickly it transitions from, uh, from you know vent limited to full flashover also a good example with the bailout system i'm a huge bailout proponent i don't think anybody's going to get their bailout system out in time to use this the other side of this and this is a discussion point this isn't me telling you what to do but the, dis the discussion point of this is if you're in the exterior here and you see this happening and you have guys inside are you opening a hose line and hopefully the answer is yes but we have had and don't get me wrong. It's the way it was, the way we knew at the time. We have had line of duty deaths where there was a charged hose line on the exterior that did not open up to fire involvement on the interior because they were worried about pushing the fire onto the guys. All right. So again, 
discussion points that you can have with your crew prior to it actually happening. All right, collapse. I don't want to say what can we really do, but um, sounding the floor really isn't the answer. I hate to say it, but the way these buildings are built now, laminated I-beams generally, and again, I don't say ever, never, or always, but laminated I-beams usually are not going to show signs of failure. So that whole feeling the floor as we go, more of a tongue and groove, older style uh, homes where you may get some sponginess. A lot of the times now it's just going to fail very quick. What is, what, what I've, and, and again, you can find some very good studies on this from UL, but what was really uh, surprising to me was what made basements more substantial than the construction was having sheetrock on them. So in English, a older home with no sheetrock and regular wooden joists still failed quicker than a newer home with laminated I-beams, but a finished ceiling. So that sheetrock, whether you think about it or, or not, does, does a ton, all right? So I kind of mentioned this, so I'll skip through this. Um, so now ordinary construction, what's going to kill me? And ordinary construction kind of covers a lot because it could be private dwellings, it could be multiple dwellings, it could be commercial. And that's gonna, you know, this is probably the most where you're gonna have uh, a lot of different things that could kill you. You could definitely have rapid fire transition. Depending on the size of the building, you could be lost or out of air. But the collapses usually are localized, not catastrophic, again, usually. Um, so the hazards on this could be more, a more uh, variety based, and it's going to depend on the individual um, building. What we do find with these a lot is a lot of hidden fire. So you'll be chasing fire around a lot. So just be aware, looking for fire below the reported floor, checking for fire extension above. And depending on the generation of these buildings, it is not uncommon for the fire to skip floors. Meaning, you know, for us, it's a five, six story tenement. So it's not uncommon to have a fire on the first, second, third floor. And then it'll skip four and five and go up to six. Okay, so don't just check the floor above, but make sure you're checking all areas of the building, right? This could be your commercial taxpayers. Um, the older ones generally are not going to have any lightweight to them, but the newer ones, there could be lightweight uh, construction integrated into it. Should just be aware of that. All right. These are just kind of what I consider ordinary construction, but this may change based on, again, your area. Uh, basement, still a big issue, cellar, whatever you want to call it. So Again, a fire on the first floor here, smoke showing from the first floor. I want to make sure it's not in that cellar. All right. These, bu these buildings are going to be able to isolate a lot better. If you look at either of these, depending on your staffing, I think you could see how it would take more than two or three guys to stretch a line, depending on the configuration of the staircase. And so if you're going up there to do a search, you have to anticipate that. I'm not saying it's going to take 10 minutes. But it may take a couple extra minutes for your, you know, ranch house that's 25 feet off the road. All right. So we can do a lot more isolating with these. Generally, if it's a multiple dwelling, the apartments are going to have a more substantial door. And so even just isolating the fire to that apartment will make a big difference for everyone else in that building. Usually open staircases. So that becomes a major hazard if we're not able to isolate it. Um, you know, know your, so I, I, this is not going to be specific to your towns. I'm just using it as an example of knowing my building code. So I know if I walk into a building like this on the right and I see uh, sprinklers in it, that there could be more apartments than fire escapes. So our code says if you put sprinklers in the hallway, uh, you don't need a fire escape. So that doesn't mean that your town or city is like that. It means know your basic code. That's a size up point for me to know that, hey, these people may not have any egress. And as we know, it's not fire that kill people, it's smoke. So there may be a toxic, heavy smoke condition throughout that building and no fire escape. So right away, that's telling me this is a bad situation. That's great. There are sprinklers, but that's not, not the end all be all. When you talk about high rises, again, some, this may be commonplace, some this may not be. Obviously we're gonna have a, a standpipe, but what if that standpipe's not working? Some will be sprinklered, some may not. 
between stamp pipes and elevators, you have to anticipate delays for everything. Okay, so this is really where you have to be on your game with we're not getting water onto this fire as quick as we want to. Because if it's above 75, 80 feet, even worst case scenario, probably can't hit it with a deck gun. If it's in the back and you can't get a ladder to it, the tower ladder might be out. So some of those fallbacks that we have with private dwelling and ordinary construction, we lose here. And so you just really need to be cognizant that if things are gonna go wrong, we don't have our regular fallbacks to go back on. Elevators, if your elevators go out, it's gonna make things, I mean, if it's the eighth, ninth floor, it may not be a crisis, but when you get to 50, to me, anything over 12, because that's just where I kind of came from, I was able to do 10 and then we had some 12 story buildings and at the top of those, I was like, all right, I'm done. Um, maybe I was fat and out of shape, I don't know, but, Anything over 10 to 12, I think you're really going to start taxing your resources to get up there. Okay. And I'm sure people argue with me on that. That's fine. But uh, just keep that in mind. You know, this is going to make things a lot worse if you don't have elevators when you get above that double digit area. Okay. People self evacuating. We got to get, I'm not going to do a standpipe or high rise class tonight. But getting control of those elevators is going to be key because we do not want people using those elevators for their own use, especially above the fire. OK, um, I would say conservatively, 50 percent of the fires I go to where we use a standpipe. Once we start using the standpipe, we generally zonk out at least one, if not more of the elevators. OK, so that's a major issue. Once you start flowing water, you need to anticipate that the elevators are going to start to fail at that point. The other problem with the high rises, and again, just from the uh, uh, size up perspective, never mind the standpipe and elevators, but where is the fire? Because we know stack effect, we know how the smoke's gonna move, it's gonna move through the stairway, elevator shaft, and all of that stuff. So you may not get good reports of where the fire is. You may get reports of smoke on multiple different floors. You may get reports from, from multiple apartments of a fire. Um, you know, you always say as a probie, you learn some things from the senior guys. One of the things that I, I was always taught, and it's a hundred percent steered me wrong before, but it's, it, I would say it's 75% correct. If you get reports of smoke on multiple different floors and the building has a compactor, a lot of the times, uh, the fires in that compactor and it's pushing smoke onto multiple floors. And that's why you're getting that. But if you get multiple calls for smoke on the same floor, it's probably something on that floor, probably a job or something, you know, a I don't want to say a legit food on the stove, but a heavy smoke condition of some sort. And so that's something that's always stuck with me. And um, it, it usually guides me in the right direction. Multiple, smoke on multiple floors is usually something like a compactor or whatnot, if the building has it. By all means, I've been to jobs where we got smoke on multiple floors and it was a job, but at least that made me think, you know, if it's on multiple floors, check the compactor before you go up there. Okay. But bottom line is if you're getting calls for smoke everywhere, do you want the engine to be stretching right away? Absolutely not. Because what happens if they hook up to the standpipe on the fifth floor and it ends up being on the 10th floor or vice versa? Okay. So it may be the hardest thing to do to tell the engine hey, or whoever's going to stretch, maybe you're the first to engine. Maybe this is where you make your decision. Hey, guys, we're getting so many reports of smoke all over the building. Leave your standpipe stuff. We're going to operate as a truck here. It, again, I'm not telling you how to operate, but we got to find the fire before we start stretching the line. All right. That may be the play if you don't have a good report or you have nothing showing and you really can't identify where the fire is. OK, so we got to find the fire before we start stretching hose lines. They're going to make our job a lot harder. Um, stretching in the wrong stairwell. You know, we have a lot of buildings where there's multiple stairwells. You stretch up the wrong one. You're basically out of it. All right. Uh, so just consider that. Um, and, you know. Come and get in some of the high rise. We want one stairwell designated for the attack stair because what's going to happen when we go into that hallway? There's going to be a lot of smoke coming up that stairwell. So uh, we would like to have people be able to use a different uh, stairwell for the evacuation. And then again, uh, controlling that apartment door if we can, controlling that stairwell door. And I think the biggest takeaway for high rises 
is just realizing, and I realize many of you don't have true, uh, you know, 40 story high rises, but that's not the definition of a high rise. The definition of a high rise is 75 feet. So that's seven and a half stories, eight stories, depending on where you are. And even at that, you could have a very uh, different wind condition on the ground than you could up in the sixth, seventh floor. Okay. So just be aware of that, that even if it's nice and calm down on the street, it may not be up top. All right. So this is uh, once you've determined that you have a working fire, it's not a compactor. This is definitely in a, and I will say a fireproof multiple dwelling. So this could be, uh, this doesn't need to be a high rise. If you have a three story, four story fireproof multiple dwelling, uh, this is probably going to be the most important thing to determine is what is the status of the uh, fire apartment door? Because if that fire apartment door is left open, uh, you could have a wind impacted condition at that point. You'll definitely have smoke spread throughout the uh, hallway as well as the floors above. Uh, I mean, this is what happened in the Bronx. There were a lot of other things, um, but the uh, multiple people that died, I think it was almost a year and a half ago now, um, you know, the apartment door was left open. So while there were many other issues with that building, this was a primary case of it as well. The other thing is you're making the entire hallway into basically the fire area. If you can't see, you have to actually find this apartment and that can be a challenge in and of itself. Um, and, and listen, sprinklers are going to take care of the fire 95% of the time, but they're also going to make visibility uh, treacherous. So if you have your old folks home with a large hallway and apartments on either side, yeah, the sprinklers probably going to knock down the fire, but even still, if that uh, apartment door was left open, you may still have a very dangerous smoke condition on that in that public hallway. All right. If the apartment door of this fireproof multiple dwellings closed, then most of your operations are going to be pretty clear up to that apartment door. So you can stretch your dry line up to there. You may not even need to mask up up to there. But just realize as you open up that apartment door, you're now going to contaminate the rest of the hallway. And so when we talk about operating without a hose line here, much less dangerous where our hose line is, is going to be able to be stretched right up to the apartment door. Most of these apartments are not going to be tremendous in size. So our stretch down uh, through the apartment may not be um, all that difficult. Keep in mind, depending on what you run with your standpipe kits, um, we would never, so let's say, you know, most of our apartments, let's say are 800 to 1300 square feet in the city. Well, we're using up to a couple of years ago, two and a half inch hose. There is no one in their right mind that would stretch a two and a half inch hose to an 800 square foot house. We're doing it. And I say the fire service because of friction loss and standpipe pressures and all that stuff. But just be aware, your maneuverability, your mobility cuts down tremendously. So even though that hose line is at that door ready to go, just keep in mind the amount of time that it takes to maneuver a two and a half especially through a tight area that may delay getting it to you. That may essentially have you operating without a hose line for a period of time. Once the apartment door is left open, all, all bets are off. Uh, the additional hazard here is other people opening up their apartment doors. Um, but this is where, you know, the public hall would become lights out. Hose line gets charged in the stairwell usually and wind impacted conditions could become a major issue. So just, again, that's that size up. Hey, uh, you know, ladder one to command, we're on the fire floor, the apartment uh, door was left open. That that needs to trigger to a lot of other people on the fire ground. Conditions are gonna be not great. Uh, we're gonna have to stretch that charge two and a half, charge two inch longer. And, you know, conditions are gonna be less favorable for all the civilians above as well, all right? As I said before though, the high rise multiple dwelling, I don't care about collapse anymore. Right. I think we're all aware of, you know, uh, this is not going to be a collapse situation of what's going to kill me. So now I'm worried about maybe a little bit about getting lost. But for the most part, these are smaller apartments, straight hallways, maybe an L in them shouldn't be too much of a concern. But my major issues are going to be wind impacted, whether it be from flashover or, or uh, a window failing. And then that delay in the hose line, standpipe issues, which led to a line of duty death in Asheville, North Carolina. Kinks is a huge issue. Um, one of the downsides, I don't know if it's a downside of two and a half necessarily, but 
if it's got lower pressures because the standpipe pressures aren't great, you could definitely get kinks in there. The maneuverability is an issue, as I mentioned. And so, again, just communication. This is one of those where if I'm in the apartment and I hear the engine officer keep calling for more line, keep calling for more line and not get anywhere with it, I got to start thinking to myself, hey, not that I need to bail, but I need to at least have my way out in case things go south quick. The other problem these really is the windows. Again, the windows can fail. Um, and if, it, if it's a nicer uh, high rise, probably bigger windows. So more ability for air to come in and that can change things very, very quickly. So even more than that, multiple uh, standard uh, class, uh, ordinary construction, control our openings, control our apartment door. That's gonna be the biggest thing and communicating any issues. All right. Commercial occupancies, you know, just saying commercial occupancy gives a wide variety. Um, we could have smaller taxpayers with lightweight construction, large manufacturing facilities. But the things that generally come to me with commercial occupancies is going to be search rope. And um, if it's a larger area, then getting lost and running out of air. If it's a smaller area, then it's probably got, you know, more collapse potential. And why do I say that? Can a large commercial structure that's built with lightweight truss construction collapse a hundred percent? But I think there's going to be a little more indication that we shouldn't be in that building before it gets to that point, right? So the amount of heat that needs to be produced uh, will be tremendous to reach up to those joists. And I think, and I hope that any incident commander is going to recognize that we're heading down that direction and pull us out. When we talk about the smaller taxpayer types, we may not have a heavy fire condition initially, but it could be burning right directly up against those um, uh, structural members. And we could end up in a localized uh, collapse very quickly as has been proven, unfortunately, in the fire service. But commercial occupancies overall to me, it's about getting lost, running out of air. And that to me kind of comes with the search rope. Now, I don't really do much on the search rope in the classroom portion. We do um, a mini drill outside of more just like a demonstration of it. I hate calling it a search rope. Uh, for those of you that don't even know what it is, it's about 200 feet of rope. Uh, you know, depending, there's a few different, let me see if I have, I don't think I did yet. Uh, search ropes basically um, usually around 200 feet of rope, about seven, eight millimeter rope. So smaller than what like normal life safety rope would be more like our uh, bailout system size. And uh, usually has markers on it, usually distances as well. Um, markers, meaning that it'll guide you towards the way out. Distance markers, meaning it'll tell you about how far you are in. And I hate calling a search rope because I don't want guys to search with it. But if I'm going in to find the fire, I can bring it in with me, tie it off outside, bring the bag in with me. It'll come out as I go in. And then if I need to find my way out, I can drop the bag and, and use it to guide my way out, just like we would use a hose line. Difference is, I may not want a hose line to come in with me initially because of all the reasons I talked about before, get it, having it get lost, getting the wrong direction, not being able to find the fire, things like that. But I think the search rope, uh, I, you know, you'll see if you Google it, you'll see guys doing fan patterns and stuff like that. I think that's pretty stupid for the most part. Um, you know, I think taglines have their place. But in general, that's not what I'm doing. We have a thermal imaging camera nowadays. Uh, if I have a high heat condition, I probably should not be in there without a hose line anyway. So I'm really just using that search rope as a way to get out and figure out how far in I am. So I've had a couple instances where I went in, really had honestly no idea where I was, had that search rope with me. Um, but because I had three knots, I knew I was 75 feet in, I found the fire and I was able to communicate to the engine company, not only follow the search rope, but give them a guide. Hey, you're going to need to come in about 75 feet. And where I had tied off to, it was an office building. So it was a hundred feet just to get to where I tied off the search rope. And so again, sizing up, how much hose do we need? Um, you know, where are we going to stretch from things like that helped to kind of develop that action plan helped the chief to kind of determine i had no idea how far in i was if i didn't have those knots there it, it would have been anyone's guess and so 
that's one of those things that can that can uh, be advantageous for those large areas. And even if it's not a large area, even if it's just one of those incidents where we're going in with the search rope um, or ahead of the hose line, the search rope may just be the way to tell the engine, hey, instead of take your second right and your third left and whatnot, just follow the search rope and you'll find the fire. So it, it's a decent tool for that as well. Um, but in terms of calling it a search rope, I don't know about that. So. Um, Look at there. That's pretty much the, uh, you know, the only other thing I go through is wind impacted, but I kind of talked about that as we went through tonight. Um, but that's kind of the overall view of the class, my thoughts on it. Um, and again, my big takeaways are you may think you don't operate without a hose line because you're not FDNY or a big city urban department. But if you run an ambulance with two guys on it with turnout gear or a pickup truck with two guys on it with turnout gear and a can and a couple SCBA, um, you have every possibility and likelihood at some point of being without the protection of a hose line. And so it behooves you as a chief, as a company officer, as someone that cares about your guys to at least give them the facts. Guys aren't dying every day from operating without a hose line. Um, how, if you're placed in that position, I mean, I don't think anyone wants two guys showing up in a pickup truck to a mother saying my kid's trapped on the second floor. And I don't think any fire chief's response to that is wait for the engine. So if we are going to operate in that scenario, we need to know how to do it as safely as possible. There's no way to do it safe. I'm not saying that, that there is, but even with stretching a hose line, we're losing guys on hose lines every year. Does that mean we should stop stretching hose lines into fires? Obviously, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. So how do we operate? And maybe safe isn't the right word, but as cautiously as possible to make the best outcome as possible. So that's what I ask you. Um, I'll be here for a minute or two if anyone has any other questions. Otherwise, that's really the stuff I wanted to get out there tonight. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, other than that, uh, our next seminar is going to be at the end of the month and write it down before, sorry. But that's gonna be our bailout one. Um, and we're gonna have Matt Hunt from Sterling Rope here, uh, February 28th, 7 p.m. And so Matt Hunt is basically in charge of all the fire side of Sterling. So they make the search ropes, they make the bailout ropes, they make the sink static rope. And we're not gonna do too much rope rescue, although he will certainly touch on it if you want to. Um, but any questions you have on rope, uh, how they develop it, uh, the standards, I definitely wanna talk about the standards because they're still to this day, people that think I can't train on my bailout system because suddenly I use it once and it's gonna break apart on me, which is not the case. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit and kind of get to the bottom of that but that's it guys uh thank you for uh thanks for joining and uh if you have any comments questions feedback i'll put my information in um in case for some reason you don't have it you can feel free to reach out to me after the fact so thank you guys uh if you missed it or came in late i will put this on um youtube in the next couple of days uh but thanks for your time and look forward to seeing you all out there soon